he immediately brought the world's attention to this whole Tibet issue once again. So there were high hopes. So people suddenly thought that, okay, because 1950, from 1959 the Dalai Lama came, the struggle started. So almost like, as mentioned in the documentary, it's 50 years. So for many people, this was that, this was that moment they have been waiting. And another aspect is that it's been 15 years. So many people were still coming from Tibet. But the people who came early, the next generation is also there. And they have never seen Tibet. For them, Tibet is a homeland which they inherit from their parents. But for them, they are born in India, just like many of us here. Most of us here, all of us here. So for them, for the, those generation of Tibetans, the new generation, they were you know, reaching their you know, angsty teenage time. So they were also like very upset about. They were also like you know enough is enough. We also this is the time we have to protest. So this is happening. So when all this was happening, this when in I got an opportunity to talk to the filmmakers. So they were saying that initially the documentary, the idea for this documentary was, okay, they will make a documentary about what is the Tibet situation at the moment. Then when they while they were making this documentary, this protest happened. This initially the peace march happened to the border because the Excel community thought that they have to bring the attention of the world to you know the Tibetan cause. Then nobody thought you know it was an unprecedented protest which happened inside Tibet because nobody was able to predict that you know such a protest, a protest of this massive scale is going to erupt. Then that happened. So when these two protests happened, this documentary's initial focus from making a Tibet situation documentary change from that to incorporate all these issues. Then that's why the editing of the film is also like that. You know, it cuts from this thing to that thing. That's how the documentary is structured. So this, this history is unfolding and they are document, documenting this aspect. Now just come to the present. Recently also another Olympics happened, which is the Winter Olympics which happened. Did we see a massive scale of protest like this? No. Because things have changed in China to a great extent. Like, uh, uh, like the director was saying, the surveillance in China is, the density of surveillance is so huge that it's very difficult to even protest. Then come back, what about the recent protests that happened? Like recently there was huge, massive public demonstrations against the zero COVID policy. At that time also protests happened, but again it was met with the crackdown. So this, is, this has been happening. You know, immediately after this documentary was made, and the current time we are talking, something else actually happened in Tibet, which is not mentioned is in this documentary, which I would like to bring to your attention is self-humiliation protest. It's a different language of protest in Tibet. Because even 2008 when this protest happened, it was actually met with crackdown. Like most of them were jailed, imprisoned, many of them are still in jail, most of them are under surveillance or house arrest, and many of them escaped. So then people thought that, uh, especially after this protest, the next year, there was this monk called Tape and Tashi Bhutso, and uh, this, I, yeah, Tape, yeah, the monk's name, uh, then he actually committed self humiliation which is an act of killing oneself or by fire, which they say is as a protest. <laughs> Till now, as the moment we're speaking, more than 150 people have committed self humiliation or have protested in a way of self humiliation in Tibet as well as in exile also. So th this struggle is very much ongoing. So now when you talk about Tibet, many people often ask this question that, okay, at 2008 this protest happened, but recently no protest happened inside Tibet. But does that mean that everything is okay? So that's the important question which I was thinking. The one of the speakers, if you see in this documentary, her name was Hadun. She was, she, she, is the Students for Free Tibet coordinator, she spoke. She made that embrace, rise and fall mention. So she wrote in Twitter that, you know, if there are no voices coming out from Tibet, if there are no voices coming out from Tibet, it doesn't mean that there is no voice. It doesn't mean that there, there is no voice. It can also mean that the voice is repressed. That's the important thing. And that, that, that aspect of voice is very important not just in a Tibetan context, but any context where people are protesting. Because
just because there is nobody protesting, we can't assume that there is no objection or there is no, you know, no backlash to whatever the other is or different people are saying. So that aspect is there. So, yeah. Uh, the one more thing I wanted to mention in this documentary is that Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the one more thing, another thing about this documentary which I would like to bring to your attention, you know, you, s you might have noticed that this, they showed a filmmaker name called Tundu Wangchen. So he, you know, you might have seen uh, the cassettes which he, sh the secret footages he showed, and you know what happened to Tundu Wangchen? That's another interest, no, interesting thing, it's harrowing to listen to, obviously. But that's uh, something which you should all, you know, just Google up and just see what happened. But I will just say what happened. You know, Dundu Bhavchan, his friend Golo Jigme, both of them, you know, they, inside Tibet, many people protested, public demonstration happened, people were protesting in different way. So these two people thought, uh, Dundu Bhavchan and Golo Jigme, they thought that, okay, they will protest through Vishwas. So they went secretly, they showed these images, different, different footages, and then they smuggled these footages because when, when they were shooting this th documentary, I'm talking about a time when this documentary is also happening. You know, simultaneously in China, in Chinese occupied but when this is happening, they were shooting these footages. And while they were shooting these footages, they are getting information that, okay, I mean, it's, they don't even have to get the information because it's very natural that, you know, when somebody is doing this activity, the states, I will obviously be on them. So they know that they will be targeted by the state, there will be a crackdown. So they somehow they managed to smuggle the footage outside. And then they made a brief scene in which, you know, uh, Dalai Lama's image is shown on TV and people are showing the devotion. That's actually a scene from a film called Leaving Fear Behind. It's available for free on YouTube or you can watch it in filming for Tibet website also. You know, that documentary is another example of how we you know, that's the power of documentaries also, right? Because visuals have that power. Even after 10 years or 15 years, it can always show that, okay, this this has happened before. This this is this has been happening. So though that film combined with this film, it actually takes back us to a particular specific period in time of Tibet's struggle or the Tibet's history, which is now history for many of us who are actually watching. But for the community, it's actually not history. It's very much what is ongoing. So this is another aspect which I, I would like to bring to many of your attention, most of your attention. And finally, finally the purpose of, uh, uh, finally something about the topic which I was supposed to talk, which was like the aesthetics. So what does <coughs> films, that's a question which I started initially also. Like, what visuals does? What's the role of visual in this whole thing? You know, famously, I think Susan Sondag famously said, if there is no image of something, some event, there is no absolutely zero image of some event, then later on, people will say that it never happened. You know, that's the thing about our world. If there is no image of something, it never happened. You know, many of this, like I mentioned, this 150 people actually, you know, did self simulation in Tibet. Some of the videos and footages are available, and some of them are not available. Especially the recent one, as a, as a 25 year old uh, Tibetan singer, very <laughs> famous singer, like he's famous across, you know, uh, Tibet as well as in China, Sewang Norbu. And he was the one who did uh, self simulation in uh, this year. And when that self simulation happened, there is no no footage, no, there is no image of that self simulation. It's, it doesn't mean that you know, we are actually seeking for that image. You know, there is no need for that image to confirm that it happened, but that image is not there. So when you don't have that image, the problem is that people can easily say that oh, it didn't happen. That's the power of these kind of documentaries. You know, these are actually interventions. These are actually act, this, this making of this documentary itself is political, to use a very Godard sense, making of this documentary itself is a political act, because these documentaries show a certain story of a certain period, and it's actually for the future generations. You know, they made this documentary in 2008, and we are discussing 
you know, when uh, Bala sir actually asked me like, which film we can show or which film uh, we can actually think of when, you know, to communicate about Tibet, you know, the one film that immediately came to my mind was this documentary only and we were having that discussion also. Because this documentary has that, you know, that, that power to you know, transcend the period. So that's the thing about visuality. So I think I don't have to uh, talk much about the documentary and Madhura will obviously cover the larger politics of uh, the community but the community and everything. But in the discussions we can have uh, like more you know, interactive uh, things. And thank you so much. Thanks for saying it. Thank you so much, uh, Gokul, for that passionate talk. So I'm a little bit nervous to follow you now. Um, and before I begin, I just want to say thanks to, do, uh, to the entire C3S team. Thank you, Commodore Vasan, Bhadra Subramanyam, uh, Danya, for having us here today. And like Gokul said, I think it makes a huge um, difference to us as researchers of the Tibetan community, but also to the community to have a screening and center Tibetan voices and Tibetan concerns in our discussions about exile politics, about filmmaking, and about so many of the other concerns that we speak about. Because I think what matters at some level is to really center their voices, their concerns, rather than treat Tibet as an object within our own understanding of what are our high politics and our concerns as, an, uh, as a country. So what I wanted to do today, because you know Gokul has covered the uh, visual politics of this film, I wanted to situate uh, Sun Behind the Clouds within the broader context of exile politics, both of exile politics in the present, but also what this movie does in terms of asking questions about the future. So broadly, like, you know, the three things that I really wanted to flag, the first thing is, you know, exile has been a protracted condition over the last 60 plus years. And as the Dalai Lama himself says at one point, he feels a little bit hopeless. But like uh, Ladonla said, which I thought was very powerful, empires rise and empires fall. So 